Hey everyone, Ryan here. Welcome back to our pharmacology series. This video, we're going to talk about autonomic nervous system pharmacology. And this will be a bit of a longer video because this is a complex topic, but nothing to worry about. We'll break it up into these bite-sized pieces. So we're not only memorizing drug names, but also understanding how they work. And we'll start by unpacking the physiology of the autonomic nervous system. So I'll be using certain acronyms and color coding throughout this video. So from here on out, PSNS stands for parasympathetic nervous system and will be purple, and SNS stands for sympathetic nervous system and will be green. So in general, the PSNS and SNS nerves control the same organs but have opposing effects on them. So the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the fight or flight response, and the PSNS is responsible for rest and digest, also sometimes called feed and breed response. So these types of responses will be absolutely central to this video, and we'll dive more into that in the next slide. The main exceptions to this rule, that both branches of the autonomic nervous system control the same organs but have opposite effects on them, is that vasculature is controlled exclusively by the sympathetic nervous system, and whether it's turned on or turned off, and sweat glands are induced by both the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. But otherwise, most other organs are following this trend. So the PSNS originates from the cranial nerves and the sacral nerves. And we can see that in the image with these purple nerves originating from the cranial section and the sacral section. Whereas the sympathetic nerves originate from the thoracic and the lumbar nerves, or the thoracolumbar region. And no autonomic nerves originate from the cervical region of the spine. So that's a little bit interesting. Where they originate is very, very stratified based on what system, what branch of the system they're involved in. All right, so I cannot stress how important this is to understanding this video. Again, by and large, these two divisions of the autonomic nervous system control all the same organs, but have opposite effects on them. So let's look at some examples. For the eyes, fight or flight, adrenaline is pumping. We need to be able to see that tiger chasing you through the woods. So the eyes dilate really wide. On the other hand, when you're resting, this really isn't necessary, so the pupil can constrict. For the mouth, when you're relaxing and eating a meal, saliva helps break down the food. So we want stimulated saliva in the rest and digest phase. But you don't have time for that when you're running away or you're stressed out. You get a dry mouth. The heart, pretty self-explanatory. When we're in fight or flight mode, we have a racing, pumping heart. And when we're resting, it goes down decreased function. For the airway, if we're running for our lives, we need as much oxygen as we can get. So the airway will dilate and relax to allow more oxygen flow. Whereas when we're resting, we can, we can afford to have the airway constrict. For digestion, again, pretty self-explanatory. If we're resting and digesting, we want stimulated digestion, peristalsis, and all the things that come along with that. And then lastly, for bladder, we typically pee when we're taking a break in the bathroom or in the middle of the night, not when we're super energized. So the bladder constricts to help facilitate this, and the bladder relaxes and can hold more when in dire situations. So to summarize, for fight or flight, pupil dilation, dry mouth, pounding heart, faster breathing, and tense muscles. Rest and digest, feed and breed, just as they sound, are the opposite pupil constriction, more saliva, relaxed heart, slower breathing, peristalsis, and digestion activated. So we talked a lot about receptors in the last video on pharmacodynamics. So now we can talk about specific receptors and how they function in the autonomic nervous system. So ionotropic receptors are essentially ion channels. Once activated, the ion channel opens, 
allowing for passage of sodium, calcium, and other ions. Metabotropic receptors are essentially G-protein coupled receptors, or GPCR for short, also called a 7-pass transmembrane domain receptor because it passes through the membrane 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times. Once activated, it in turn activates a secondary or second messenger, and this involves a system with cyclic AMP, calcium, and other messengers. So the ion part of ionotropic, referring to it being an ion channel, and metabotropic perhaps refers to its influence on metabolic processes. So definitely commit these two to memory even before we go to the next slide, because this will come up all throughout the video. All right, so let's talk about receptors in the ANS. So cholinergic receptors bind acetylcholine. Cholin refers to acetylcholine, which is the ligand that activates this receptor type. And there are two forms of it. The nicotinic receptor, or the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, binds acetylcholine, but it also binds nicotine, hence the name. This one is always ionotropic, so it's an ion channel. The other form of cholinergic receptor is the muscarinic receptor, or muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. This one also binds acetylcholine, but it also binds muscarine, hence the name. And this one is always metabotropic, so it's always a G-protein coupled receptor. Now, nicotine you might be familiar with. It's an alkaloid and stimulant that is naturally produced in the nightshade family of plants. Muscarine is a natural alkaloid found in certain mushrooms. So that's the cholinergic receptor type, and that's involved with the PSNS, hence why it's in purple. And the adrenergic receptor type is involved with the sympathetic nervous system. So adrenaline refers to the adrenal gland where epinephrine and norepinephrine, otherwise known as adrenaline and noradrenaline, are produced. And of course, they are the ligands that activate this receptor type. And these are also always metabotropic. So they're G protein coupled receptors. Now this is an incredibly helpful diagram and we're gonna break it down and simplify it so you can easily memorize these more complex topics in a more simplified way. Each neuronal pathway here is, is composed of a preganglionic nerve before the ganglion, a ganglion which contains synapses between nerves, and a postganglionic nerve after the ganglion. Then finally, the target organ. So let's start with the parasympathetic nervous system where there's only one layout to memorize. This one has a long preganglionic nerve, a ganglion that's, as a result, pretty close to the target organ, and then a, sh a rather short postganglionic nerve, both of which release acetylcholine. The sympathetic nervous system has two different pathways. Both of them start with a short preganglionic nerve to either a ganglion in the sympathetic trunk or at the adrenal medulla of the adrenal glands, which sit above each kidney. From there, you either go to a long postganglionic nerve where norepinephrine is released to the target organ or epinephrine and norepinephrine are directly secreted into the bloodstream and arrive to the target organs that way. So all ganglion receptors and medulla receptors are ionotropic nicotinic receptors in both the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems, hence why they're colored black here and I've colored it black up there as well. So they're technically involved in both branches of the autonomic nervous system, they're always the first receptor you come across. All target organs of the autonomic nervous system are metabotropic. They're all G-protein coupled receptors. 
with the parasympathetic nervous system being muscarinic, hence why it's purple, and the sympathetic nervous system, you can probably guess, are adrenergic receptors, hence why they're green. So this is our key that you may want to screenshot and refer back to as we talk about specific receptors like M2, M3, alpha-1, alpha-2 later in the video. So this will be our reference for everything that comes next. And this is just a review of essentially everything we've talked about so far in written form. All right, so we're going to start talking about cholinergics. This is the specific pharmacology for the parasympathetic nervous system. So we talked about acetylcholine as the primary ligand for these receptors. So let's talk a little bit about how it's made. So acetylcholine is the synthesis of acetyl-CoA and choline. And the name makes a lot of sense as being a combination of these two. This reaction is catalyzed by choline acetyltransferase and reversed by acetylcholinesterase, or just cholinesterase for short. This will come up again later when we're talking about specific mechanism of action of certain drugs. So the acetylcholine molecule can activate nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. So these are specific parasympathetic nervous system postganglionic receptor types. We have M1 through M5. Depending on the number, they have different target organs that they'll activate. So let's look at the M2 receptor. The M2 receptor acts on the heart and inhibits the SA and AV nodes to decrease heart rate and electrical conduction. So this receptor, if activated, is essentially calming the heart down, which, if you think about it, is a very rest and digest thing to do. That's one of the things we talked about. The M3 receptor acts on smooth muscle, specifically causes smooth muscle relaxation, again, which is a very rest and digest thing to do. So it technically does a lot of things related to smooth muscle. And to remember the bulk of it, remember these two acronyms, SLUDS and BAM. So SLUDS stands for salivation, lacrimation, which are tears, urination, defecation, and sweating, which can also be called diaphoresis. BAM stands for bronchoconstriction, constriction of the airway, abdominal cramps, and which makes sense because that's referring to digestion and peristalsis, this activity and movement of food through the intestines. And finally, meiosis, which is constriction of the pupils. So these are all, everything on this slide are rest and digest things that we talked about at the very beginning of the video. So it makes sense that if these receptors are activated as part of the parasympathetic nervous system, they're causing these rest and digest activities. So now let's talk about the specific drugs. So we have M agonists. These are drugs that are going to agonize. They're going to induce the function of these receptors, these muscarinic receptors. So that's why I have a green check mark here. They're going to be activating those receptors. And they're non-selective non for all of the muscarinic receptors. So they'll affect all of them if the drug is administered systemically, M1 through 5. Therefore, they should not be used systemically with the following conditions. So if a patient has peptic ulcers, we don't want to stimulate more digestion and more secretion of gastric acid. So that makes sense why we'd want to avoid it there. If a patient has asthma or COPD, well, we don't want to constrict the bronchioles even more and make breathing even more difficult for that person. And CHF, which is congestive heart failure, well, we don't want to slow down the heart even more because they're, they already have decreased cardiac output. So as you can see, we're simply applying the rest and digest principles here. So here is a list of drugs that are M agonists. They're muscarinic agonists. 
So I won't read through every single one and every single mechanism of action, but I do want to go over just the broad categories of what some of these drugs are. So we have our direct acting muscarinic agonists that activate the muscarinic receptor directly. It's essentially a mimic of the acetylcholine molecule. And indirect acting, and oh, I will mention that pilocarpine does have um, does have some limited use in the dental world because it can stimulate saliva as an oral rinse. That one does uh, tend to come up, uh, potentially to come up in part of the board exam. Indirect acting instead non-competitively inhibits that acetylcholinesterase molecule. So it's inhibiting the molecule that reversed the biosynthesis reaction for acetylcholine. So in this way, it's making sure that acetylcholine is ready and active, ready to induce the muscarinic receptors. So we have a couple of different options here, some that reversibly inhibit the enzyme, and some that are incredibly potent, that irreversibly inhibit the enzyme. And these are poisonous things. These are toxic. And one thing to know for the board exam is that this type of uh, toxic reaction can be treated with pralidoxime, specifically with insecticide poisoning. So on the other end of the spectrum, we have muscarinic antagonists or anti-muscarinics. So these are blocking the M receptor and they directly compete with the function of acetylcholine. So they're blocking those active sites that acetylcholine is trying to get to on the muscarinic receptors. So all of these are doing things that are opposing that rest and digest response. Now we have nicotinic antagonists or ganglionic blockers. So these drugs are blocking the nicotinic receptors at the ganglions. And this produces, as you can imagine, an incredibly potent effect to suppress the parasympathetic nervous system. But it also binds at the nicotinic receptors in the sympathetic nervous system, because remember, those are the first receptors regardless of what branch you're in. So the quaternary ammonium group allows all of these drugs to directly block the nicotinic receptors. The non-polarizing ones can be used as an oral antihypertensive, but they can produce orthostatic hypotension, which is a side effect. And nicotine is a stimulate, stimulant. It binds to the nicotinic receptor, but cannot be removed. And it's the addictive substance found in tobacco products. So nicotinic antagonists can also be neuromuscular blockers. So these drugs actually block the nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction in the somatic nervous system. It's the same type of receptor. It's that N, this triangular N that I have up here. It's not actually triangular, but that's for my reference key. So it's the same type of receptor as we saw in the autonomic nervous system. This is technically outside that autonomic nervous system because this is for voluntary skeletal muscles. But I included these for comprehensiveness sake. So these drugs here are used as skeletal muscle relaxants. And there's our receptor type. All right, now let's talk about adrenergics. This is the branch of pharmacology concerned with the sympathetic nervous system. So for this one, instead of talking about acetylcholine, we're going to talk about the synthesis of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So this biosynthesis reaction is a little bit more complex. We start with tyrosine, we go to L-dopa, go to dopamine, then norepinephrine, which can be activating this receptor type, or we can go even further and go to epinephrine or adrenaline. And so both of these molecules can activate the adrenergic receptors. For categorization, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine are referred to as the catecholamines. You may have seen that word come up in your studies before. 
And monoamines, which we'll come to again when we talk about the central nervous system, this includes the same three, but we add on serotonin and histamine to that group. All right, now we can talk about the adrenergic receptor types. So we have alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. Alpha-1 and alpha-2 act on smooth muscle of the vasculature. Beta-1 and beta-2 act on the SA and AV nodes of the heart. So beta-1 acts on the SA and AV nodes of the heart. Remember, M2 from before also acts on the heart. So beta-1 and M2 work on the heart and do opposite things to it. And lastly, we have beta-2, which makes smooth muscle relax. So it relaxes the bronchioles to open the airway, like an albuterol inhaler in a person with asthma to help them, to help them breathe during an asthma attack. So the alpha receptors, I mentioned they constrict the vasculature, or they act on the vasculature of the blood vessels. And so this makes sense. Alpha-1, when activated, is causing vasoconstriction. It also causes urinary retention and pupil dilation, which is known as mydriasis. It's the opposite of meiosis that we saw before in the parasympathetic nervous system. So all of these things are perfectly in line with the fight or flight response, which we talked about at the beginning of the video. Alpha-2 is a little bit weird. We'll talk more about it a bit later, but let's just say for now, it also causes vasoconstriction. So constriction of the vasculature or blood vessels. And the beta receptors. So beta-1 receptor, as I mentioned before, acts on the SA and AV nodes of the heart. And so whereas the M2 receptor caused bradycardia, this one can tend towards tachycardia. So we're increasing the heart rate, increasing electrical conduction, and the strength of contraction. And also the renin release from kidneys. So renin release from uh, renin releases from the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys, which converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, which favors a reaction to induce vasoconstriction, which is, again, a fight-or-flight response. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. The only thing that's out of whack here is the vasodilation induced by the beta-2 receptor, which we'll touch on a bit more later. All right, so we have some adrenergic agonists. So these are drugs that are, again, agonizing the receptor. This time, they're, ag they're agonizing the adrenergic receptor type. So we have a bunch of drugs here, isoproteranol, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, which can be administered as drugs themselves, Sudafed, afranasal spray, and a lot of these are activating either some or all of the adrenergic receptors. And so they're, they're causing fight or flight response, depending on which receptor they're acting on. And of course, we also have adrenergic antagonists. So these are drugs that are going to be blocking the adrenergic receptors, and they directly compete with norepinephrine. So you may have heard the term beta blocker, which is exactly as it sounds. These drugs, some of them here, are blocking the beta receptors. And so they're used to calm the heart down, which it makes sense because the beta-1 receptor is the one that acts on the heart tissue. So beta blockers block one or more beta adrenergic receptors. So next we have sympathomimetics which don't actually bind to either the alpha or beta receptors, but they mimic the effects of a sympathetic agonist. And they do this in various different ways. So the first three stimulate the release of stored norepinephrine. So they release norepinephrine that's already in the nerve cells. They release it into the synapses so they can activate 
the adrenergic receptors. Tyramine is actually found in wine, cheese, chocolate, and other foods. So you can remember this as Tyra loves wine, cheese, and chocolate. Next, we have a couple other drugs here that inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. And so this is essentially inhibiting that released norepinephrine from being taken back into the nerve cells to be recycled. So they're stuck out in the synapse and they're continually activating that receptor. And we also have some antidepressants which inhibit the reuptake of not only norepinephrine, but also serotonin. So when we talk about the central nervous system pharmacology in a future video, we'll talk more about this, and we'll also talk more about dopamine. These are monoamines that are involved in the central nervous system and how it activates in that way. And of course, we have the opposite, which are the sympatholytics. And so these, Again, don't actually bind to the alpha or beta receptors, but they mimic the effects of a sympathetic antagonist. And again, they do this in various different ways. So guanethidine inhibits the release of norepinephrine. So it's essentially opposite to amphetamine and these ephedrine and these types. So they inhibit the release of norepinephrine from the nerve cells. Reserpine or reserpine depletes the norepinephrine stores, thus inhibiting their eventual release. So it's depleting the norepinephrine that's stored inside the nerve cells. So there's less to be released into the synapses where it can bind to the receptors. And lastly, we have clonidine and methyl dopa. Now remember before when I, I mentioned that the alpha-2 receptor is a bit weird, and this is why. So these drugs are actually agonists of alpha-2, which would make you think, because it's an adrenergic receptor, and if we're agonizing it, wouldn't that induce a fight-or-flight response? But it actually does the opposite. When the alpha-2 receptor is agonized by either of these two drugs, it's actually blocking the sympathetic nervous system. And that's because the alpha-2 receptor is exclusively located in the central nervous system. And when it's activated, it in turn blocks the transduction of a sympathetic nervous system signal. So it blocks that signal from propagating, and in doing so, has an antagonistic effect on the sympathetic nervous system. And this is why methyl dopa is often referred to as the false transmitter. So that's about as simple as I could put it, but it definitely is a complex, complex idea to wrap your head around that when the alpha-2 receptor is agonized, it actually blocks a fight-or-flight response. All right, and lastly, let's talk about two concepts that routinely come up on the board exam related to autonomic nervous system pharmacology. So epinephrine reversal refers to this vasoconstrictor effect of epinephrine that's converted into a vasodilatory effect in the presence of an alpha blocker, whereby the beta-2 vasodilator effect becomes the major vascular response. So remember when I said before that the only thing out of whack about the beta receptors was that beta-2, when activated, causes a vasodilatory effect which is exactly opposite of what you would think would happen for a fight or flight response. So basically, an alpha blocker like prozosin or fentolamine that we saw in the previous, previous slides as some of the drugs I had listed there, when an alpha blocker like one of those cancels out epinephrine's natural ability to activate alpha receptors, it only activates beta receptors, leading to a net vasodilatory effect. And this is known as epinephrine reversal and is yet another example of drug interactions where if we combine certain drugs together, we can get these side effects that if we don't take into consideration could lead to problems and complications.
And lastly, we have the vasovagal reflex. So we talked in or the oral surgery series about vasovagal syncope, which is the most common form of fainting, whereby there is a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic and the parasympathetic, or vagal system, are regarded as antagonistic systems, right? They're normally in equilibrium. If one, of, one is active, the other one is inhibited in order to compensate. And so you're either getting a net fight or flight or a net rest or digest response in every target organ. But this is an example when the systems, unfortunately, malfunction. Basically, we have baroreceptors that constantly monitor our blood pressure and alter the rate and strength of heart contractions and alter the diameter of blood vessels accordingly. This is mediated by both the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, this is an oversimplification, but norepinephrine released by the sympathetic nervous system can activate baroreceptors which stimulate the vagal reflex to reduce the heart rate, leading to an opposite response to what norepinephrine usually does. So, sinus bradycardia could be controlled, albeit temporarily, by a vagolytic drug like atropine, but this is just one of many examples where the system doesn't work quite as intended. And although I laid everything out as ideal in terms of what the receptor types are and what they do and what drugs will do to them, but there are examples just like this where the system just doesn't work quite as it was designed. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I know it was a complicated topic, so feel free to rewind and rewatch the video as you need and reference the charts and the different things I have in this video because they're extraordinarily helpful for digesting this material, no pun intended, for rest and digest. Thank you so much for watching again. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Ainz Lau, David Jaden, Yanit, and all of my patrons for their support. You guys are the reason why I can keep making these videos like I do. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.